recorded this podcast following a virtual discussion group on the topic of innovation in the boardroom. I was then joined by one of the speakers from the session, Karen Fawcett, and by Mui Hoon Po, who are also both Critical Eye board mentors, and we discussed some of the key themes which emerged from the previous conversation. Thank, thanks, uh, Karen and, and Mui Hoon, for, for joining me after the, the, the discussion we've just finished, uh, Innovation in the Boardroom. Um, I thought it was a, a fairly wide-ranging, as, as usual, and an interactive discussion and some key themes that came, came out of that. Um, I'd really like to, um, to, to, to welcome you to this podcast, our first Asia Critical Eye podcast, and, uh, and, and to get your thoughts really on the discussion we've just had. Um, I gave some key points that came out for me, but can I ask you, first of all, just um, starting with yourself, Karen, just to give us a brief introduction for, for those Critical Eye members who don't know you, uh, and, and then uh, Mui Hoon to you, and then we'll so, sort of start taking apart the discussion we've just had. So, um, uh, Karen... Thanks for joining us again. And uh, can you introduce yourself, please? I'd be delighted to. So I've been living in Asia for more than 30 years. Um, my career is 16 years as a strategy consultant, 16 years as a banker. And now I have a portfolio of non-executive directorships um, ranging from LGT, um, private banking, um, INSEAD Business School, Temus, the new Temasek um, technology um, company, um, a, a fintech and um, advising a biotech. So a very nice, as well as actually now on the board of the Global Evergreening Alliance, which is totally different, land restoration and helping climate change. Thanks very much, Karen. And you forgot to, to mention, I know deliberately that you're also a board mentor with Critical. <laughs> The um, most and important role. <laughs> as, as is um, our, our fellow guest here, um, Po Mui Hoon, who also who's been instrumental in, in setting up the, the Singapore Institute of Directors Partnership, which we've had with you for, for the past two years, I think now. Um, welcome, to, welcome to you as well. And, and, and if you can give us, uh, as well as your Critical Eye Board mentor role, your, your sort of uh, portfolio roles that you're involved in, that would be, that would be great to hear. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael. And um, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I'm really uh, glad to be here with both you and, uh, you and Karen to do this. And um, I'm, a, I'm a council member for the Singapore Institute of uh, Directors, and I actually chair its digital, uh, digital uh, transformation committee. Um, and I have to add, that I'm a critical eye board mentor, and, and that's why I'm involved here. Um, I've sit on various boards, uh, in particular, the Singapore Pools board, uh, the Cystic.com board, um, and also uh, as, as an advisor to, to certain um, uh, startup organizations in the FinTech area. And I'm also on the uh, NTU, NTU research grant uh, panel. Right, and, and right now I do also have a, a startup that I'm uh, actually meant, uh, meant nurturing in the food tech space, right? So I've got quite a few, few things going and keeping me, me busy. Um, all through my executive career, I've been with tech companies and have been group CEO of various companies before I uh, took on a more portfolio approach towards what I want to do. Thanks, thanks very much, Maureen. And I think it was a discussion or conversation we'd had uh, a while back that sparked the, the topic for this um, discussion group we've just had on innovation um, and around sort of potentially missing out on, on technologies and, uh, and, and, and being ahead of the curve as, as a board member. And how do you keep on top of all of those things? What, one of the interesting um, points that we, we, we spoke about on the discussion group just now and that I think I'd like to, to, to talk to you about um, both is, is around the culture of innovation. Um, you know, how do you keep, how do you maintain that culture? What does it look like? And, and how do you uh, look at, you know, failure as part of part and parcel of the innovative process? Is, is that something that you, you, you agree came, came out of the discussion? I, there, was, there was quite a lot of talk around culture. Um, Karen, is that, you know, when you go into a, a board um, role, how do you assess the culture? How do you contribute to, to it? Um, how do you monitor it? Um, or, or just your thoughts on, on some of the, the conversations we had around culture, because I think it's a key part to, to, to most of the conversations we have at, at board level. Mm, I think I think culture is absolutely critical, and, and we look. We would. I think what came out in the conversation for me was both the culture of the board, the way the board dynamics work, 
as well as the, the culture of the company itself. So one of the things that came out at sort of the, the way the board works to foster innovation was making sure the, the board is very diverse and has lots of different opinions, that there's, there's the skill set there, that the board are keeping themselves up to date. Um, and, and also that the board is efficient and actually has time to um, actually spend time on topics like innovation. Um, but the, the culture of the company um, came, resonated very strongly, that, that you have to have a culture which will, um, to some extent, be willing to accept, I think accepting failure is the wrong word. It's, it's learn from mistakes and be able to move on and have a framework for managing innovation so that you, firstly, you can afford it um, and, and you can build on things quickly, whether that's across businesses or different ways of doing things. But uh, the culture is really critical. Yeah, we, we, and you mentioned during the discussion, you know, the the, and I, I agree with you, Karen. The fa failure isn't probably not the the right word to use, but a, you know, a, a learning culture is is, is is essential. But it's not always as acceptable in in say in Singapore, in in Hong Kong, where where where, where I am, in other parts of Asia, as it may be in in say the UK and Europe. Is that something that you find? Um, is developing, is 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 growing? The ability to say, well, we tried this, it didn't work, but um, or, or, or do you find that quite challenging when on, on the board you sit in? Well, yeah, yeah ab absolutely. And that was actually uh, one of the questions that I wanted to, to us to discuss if we had the time, but we didn't have the time. But I, I, I really think that a lot of people say that, you know, learn fast, fail fast, and uh, there's no blame to, 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 to failing, right? And is it really true? I mean, to me, to me, to actually... Um, have that culture to not be too sticky about failing projects is crucial if you really want uh, innovation to happen. But I think in practice, it is not so mm -hmm. clear that it is, it is so acceptable, right? And especially, I would say, in Asia. So, so that's the first point, right? And the second point, I guess I was trying to make on the call was that Actually, innovations come from a series of sparks that are generated by robust debates between board and management. It's never really about a single flash of insight from any single person, right? So that ability for the board and management to have that rigorous discourse and debate over time is really key. And some, some, some time ago, Harvard, Harvard Business School called that process a, brace, a creative abrasion. And that is really the the put involve that really involve putting some friction to the discussion to fight the status quo, right? And sometimes you do need to create that tension to stimulate the thinking, the ideas, and the innovation. And that creative operation is actually, I believe, a core capability needed to engage in innovative uh, problem solving. If you ask me, right? Yeah. But but. I would say that a lot of the boards, especially in Asia, and because they are all family, a lot of them are family or in, uh, family owned businesses, even they can be listed. There's still a very dominant chairman, dominant family presence within the board, right? And, and so I just do feel that, you know, many boards are reluctant to have the frank conversations required to, for innovation because the dynamics of, what we call creative operation are really quite tough to manage, right? Um, if you if you if you stifle if you come across too strongly, then you stifle the discussion. Mm -hmm. But if not, then you're not challenging enough. You're too 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 supportive, and you do not push the envelopes, right? And the default from many board members tend to 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 be to avoid conflict and become a bit, I think, too polite, right? So you don't want to be the person who's like, you know challenging and 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 rubbing perhaps perhaps uh, uh, pushing the wrong buttons and making people feel uncomfortable right and facilitating that discussion that what we call creative operation is probably a delicate uh, dance right and and you know as I said before you know you you really have to make sure that that conversation um, 
uh, is productive and yet constructive and, and at the same time is challenging enough, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a lot there's a lot there to 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 build on. I think really good point. I, wh- how do you, as a board member or as a potential board member, presumably you're brought into companies to to add something, to add value, and to deliver you know your expertise, your view on things. And and, and part of that, I'm I'm sure, is you know innovative approaches to to, to thinking, to technology, to, to all the things we discussed. How can you do do due diligence on a company to look at that culture and if it's there? And, and because it, mu- it must be quite soul destroying to get into a board and thinking I'm excited I'm going to add value to this to this company and then to be told that's not how we do things here um, we, we 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 outsource that or we, we don't get involved how can you how can you sort of examine that um, and, and and maybe Karen your most recent um, appointment with uh, with Temus you know there must have been some um, some conversations or thoughts in your head a- a- around that is that something you can do can you can you examine a culture of a of a business before you're in the hot seat? You, you can to an extent. I mean, obviously, um, you know, organizations like Critical Eye can be incredibly helpful in putting you in touch with other people um, to sort of do as much due diligence and meet people before you join. And, and whether it's employees or other board members or, or big customers of, of the company. Um, and, uh, but I think it's it's very difficult to see how a board is going to work until you're sitting on that board because it is the dynamics of a group of people around the table. And it's not until you realize how they play off against each other and the way the chairman works and everything else. But I would say board dynamics don't need to be stationary, that they can change. And one of the discussions we had today was how um, boards are often killed with the amount of paperwork you know, 300-page presentations, death by PowerPoint and all that stuff, um, designed to keep us in our box and just get us to rubber stamp. If you put different disciplines in place around numbers of pa- numbers of pages, time on discussion, summarizing, focus on the questions, things like that, you can change the dynamics of that board enormously. Um, one, one of the other things that came out in the discussion for innovation is is having smaller groups or having having side meetings with the board, the idea of having teach-ins with, with management. Again, you, you change the dynamics. So I would say we love to do our due diligence before we get on boards, but actually we have to do the hard work once we're on the boards. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely agree with Karen. I think you can you can only know so much, right? And, and how does the board process typically start? I mean, it starts by... People, you know, I guess talking to you about whether whether you would like to be on the board, and then you start that. It's almost like an interview process, right? Yeah. So as as we all, I mean, we can talk to different people, the board, the management, and all that. But you know, the the likelihood of actually really know what's going on is really when you're in that seat, right? And you can see that dynamics between the different board members and even between the board and the management, right? Because other than that, you 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 pretty much um if you ask certain questions, you probably get the right answers, right? right. <laughs> the answers yeah, well, that no, to be correct. <laughs> knowing the questions to ask as well is probably probably key in that point. And I guess people people can change and their approaches can change under under pressure in, in times of crisis and 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 when there's high risk involved. So yeah, again, things can change quite quickly. But this comes down to then having the processes and, and rigor in place. And as you say, Karen. You know, timing. Be strict on things like that. Having having shadow shadow boards. Some people have they call them more sub yeah. sub boards and that sort of thing. So you can then experiment in those before you come to the 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 the, the, the boardroom itself. Um, I, I'm I'm interested in. I mean, that does lead into culture. And, and I'm interested, Karen, maybe in your views of have you seen from a um let's say from a from a UK European point of view. Um, have you had to change your style at all when you when you're sitting on on boards in in Asia? Is there anything that 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 you felt consciously that you have to do differently um, from from that aspect, or is that not really something that's because you've been in in this part of the world for so long? It's it's just it's just how you are. That's just your your natural style anyway. Look, I think I think boards tend to be quite formal anywhere in the world. They are quite formal. And I think that fits with um, elements of the Asian culture very well. Um, I think the culture of a board is 
actually a lot more about the company than the location it's in. Okay. And, it's, and it's, a, it's a function of the group of people. So the more diverse a board is, the more you know, open the culture will be. Um, I think the risk with some of the boards I've come across, um, I'm thinking back to my consulting days um, with, with Asian companies, when it really is, hasn't evolved sufficiently from friends and family. And you, you have a very linear amount of thinking and often quite dominated by the founder who is also the chairman. And that, that's where you're going to get quite limited thinking, I would have thought, in a boardroom. And adding diversity into that can liven things up enormously and improve the quality of the board, but it, but it changes the role of the board. And right. some companies are, are ready for that and some aren't. Thanks. Thanks. Absolutely. I, I want to kind of jump in here on that point, Michael, because um, really um, the diversity of the port is what what drives the, the I would say that the richness of uh, perspectives and the diversity of thought within the board. Right. And innovation re really requires passionate discussion, debate and even conflict, most often among individuals with diverse perspectives. I mean, if you're all of the same mind, there's nothing much to really debate about in a sense. And in Singapore, we have this term called the old boys club. Uh, you must have heard of that, Karen. Right? But that, that means... Does that exist in every country? <laughs> yes, yes, right. So, so, so less, like what Karen said, I think that the first thing is getting the board diversity correct, right? And so whether it's adding or replacing members, board should really take a more disciplined approach, right, to seeking members whose probably expertise complements that of the existing board and more important that of management, right, and is, is and also um, reflect representative of the, custom, uh, the company's customers and stakeholders, mm -hmm. right, uh, with regards to factors such as gender, nationality, race, or even ethnicity, right, so, so that makes a diverse board, right, and, and that would then creates that richness that, and that debate within the board. That, that, that can, sorry, Karen, go on. I was just going to add to, add to that. And, and I came out of this discussion on innovation, realising that innovation is such an enormous topic and, and probably gets into every board paper in some way, um, that, that creating a board environment which fosters innovation and can manage innovation effectively was almost describing what was a well-run board you know so so getting the, the the making sure the board is well read and well educated on the topics make sure you have a diverse board with a lot of different opinions making sure it's efficient making sure it's open and trusting making sure it can challenge and and stay at the high level and and challenge it that, that's really describing what you want with good governance, ju not just innovation. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. And I, I think the other angle that um, we spoke about at the, at the discussion just now was about a learning board, a board that learns together, right? And, and when we talk about the diversity of individuals, but for, uh, you know, that's great. But in order to collaborate effectively, they really need this to learn together and have shared experiences and knowledge in order to serve as a foundation for their interactions and, and decision making, right? So the board really needs to, I would say, learn together, develop that, what we call contextual intelligence of the board, cultivating in particular a shared set of assumptions about where their industry and markets are going to go, right? And, and so that they are prepared to make the right risk reward judgment calls together with management. I mean, so that learning, that bringing in together, you know, that, that, that understanding of where the whole company, the industry, and, and, and even externally, where that whole thing is going, is really important uh, as, as a board to, to, yeah. to be learning together. I think some excellent point, and you're coming up with some really great terms, we know, so I'm scribbling down contextual intelligence, and um, I, I think that that's great, and it really, really get, get to the heart of what we're talking about in some of these discussions, and, and Karen, you're right, I mean, the, without, you know, going into too much detail, the conversation could have been around risk management, or it, it could have been around 
sustainable businesses or, or, or ESG reporting, because ultimately we're coming back to the, the same point of a board needs to have this diversity of thought and experience, which means you can challenge one another and you can create this robust environment, which will help the business to continue and to support the management teams. And, and the topic, of course, is relevant and you have to have, you know, some experience and, and knowledge of, of the technicalities. But ultimately, you're talking about bigger picture issues. And that I, one of the questions I was going to ask is, you know, the, the role of the board and what can the board bring to, to innovation? And you covered off some of the key points j- just there, Karen. You know, it's, it's, it's um, how you, you, you conduct that dialogue, how you some of those tough conversations you have. It might be actually I'm not adding value to this board anymore. I, I think I should step down. Um, or, or, or having those conversations with your people who've become friends, maybe, and 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 it can be quite quite challenging and tough conversations. So I think all of these um, these events we've been running with with the Singapore Institute of Directors have brought in these key themes um, that, that that come out around you know what do you do as a board director? How how do you add value? Where yeah. do you add value? Why are you on the board? And uh, I guess questions you ask yourself. So one one of the, the areas I I found fascinating is the disciplines that the board process can put in to unearth innovation. So we talked a little about making sure that examples of innovation come to the boardroom because often innovation is happening every day and is not visible. So bring it to the boardroom, celebrate it, and and understand what value it's adding. Um, put a framework around um, how you're measuring the, the, the projects and ensuring that spend is being put in the right place. I mean, we, we just heard about companies that would love to do innovation but don't have enough money. How, how do you make sure there's money in the budget allocated specifically to innovation? We also heard about structures um, that could be um, um, innovation hubs which are separate from the day-to-day business to pro- provide a safe environment. These, these are all techniques that the board can think about, um, frameworks to make sure that, uh, that innovation is on the agenda. The, the other element was um, the, the looking at competition, looking at the process of, of looking at the competitive landscape, looking at other industries which may be relevant, that will force the discussion on innovation. So I think there were specific things that we could do. Absolutely, yeah, and, and and partnerships as well. The partnership models yeah. are always to be explored. Um, I, I'm conscious, as always, we don't have enough time to continue um, these these fascinating and in depth conversations. But it was really, really great to have you both um, staying on after the discussion and, and taking time out to, to discuss with me for our our first Critical Asia podcast. So, um, I, thank you both again. Happy to have these conversations and to continue having them within within the community. And, um, and, and good luck with your, uh, your return to Singapore, Karen and Mayhoon. I very much hope to see you in Singapore um, sooner rather than later. Um, and, and both of you, thanks very much and, and take care. Look forward to the next chat. Yes, take care.